Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Over the past few years, there has been a lot of divisive rhetoric about Syrian refugees living in the U.S. The new documentary, This Is Home, a refugee story, cuts through everything we've heard and tenderly tracks the lives of four Syrian families as they arrive and attempt to assimilate into American culture. It is a beautiful and sweet film that, in my opinion, should be required viewing right now. You can check it out on Epix, May 22nd at 8 p.m. For now, let's take a look at the trailer. Kalb. Baladi. Hams. Jirani. Bete. Zikrayati. Tufuli kare tehlwi. Hams. كل شيء بالنسبة لي سيريا بلدي أمي أبي أطفالي أخواتي اشتقت طرابة ربيت فيا وأنا كبير اشتقت لبيتي اشتقت لمدرستي اللي تعلمت فيها اشتقت لأهلي اللي أنا صلي خمس سنين ما شفتهم اشتقت ل ل لمياتها، اشتقت لاكلاتها، اشتقت لشعبها، شعب بحب بعضه، شعب ماسك مع بعضه. يعني قاومت لاخر نفس بشورة اني احسن ضل ما احسن. يعني خفت على الاطفال، خفت على زوجتي. انا عندي بسوريا اخ اخذوه ما بعرف فينه ف سؤال كان حلو انه اشتقت لسوريا هذا مثل مثل عم تسالي سؤال انه عم تساليه للام او للطفل اشتقت لامك شو بده يكون رده اعتبار الطفل راح يقول لك ايش اشتقت لها راح يقول لك اني اتمسكت فيها مثل اول شخص ما يفوت البيت وين امي انا بقول لك وين بلدي everybody please welcome princess frial of jordan and director alexandra shiva and i should update June 22nd on Epix, not uh, May 22nd. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for making this uh, beautiful film that really does cut through uh, everything that we've been told and are hearing still um, over the past couple of years and up until now. I want to talk about how this began. Uh, I, Princess, I know that this was kind of, it began with you. Right. How did that, wh where did it come from? Well, it came from my background and where I'm from, and I've always been involved in the refugee issues, uh, it's in my DNA, I keep on saying. As a child, I was, my mother took me with her, she was working with the Red Cross to give refugees uh, blankets and, and um, rations. So these things never leave you. So when I was in a position to help, uh, I got involved with the refugee camps in Jordan, plenty of them. And here in America, I joined the IRC. So they, it was something I really passionately believed in. But it became very frustrating during the climax of it. And they were just coming in and in, and we didn't know whether we can host them, and we didn't know whether they'll have a good life, better life, certainly safer, but maybe not better. So it was very frustrating, and I was at loss what to do. I don't write in the press, I, uh, so I have to do one thing. I thought maybe we can reach the people and their hearts and their minds through images like this one. As it happens, it's an in-house luck. Alexandra Shiva is my goddaughter, and she does great, great films, and she's a very talented director. So I called her from Jordan. I said, Alexandra, this must be strange to you, not your field. Uh, are you reading about the refugees? Start reading. And we discussed it for three hours, and I told her what I'd like to do. I told her how I want her expertise to be used to reach you all here the ones who support us, the ones who don't know anything about us, everyone. And she said she'll do it. And that's how it started. Alexandra, was uh, your intention off the bat to, as I said before, kind of cut through all of the divisive rhetoric that's being used? Uh, I, I really think it's, you know, it's being used for the purpose of uh, campaign tactics, very cynical campaign tactics. It's, most of it isn't true. 
Um, yes, it was very important to, to me, the most interesting and engaging stories are human stories that are as specific as you can possibly get. And to, and I think that what Princess Ferrell was saying about the overwhelming nature, the idea of cutting through it was also like not having millions of nameless, faceless people. Like how about you just pick four families and you get to know them intimately and you go into their homes. And what I hope we've created is an opportunity for a viewer to be with these families and, and just and be with them and get to know them and see what their struggles, what their joys, what their resilience is all about, where it comes from. And, um, and it wasn't meant to be, um, it was meant to sort of go behind people's shut off in a way. I think that, you know, the, uh, the idea that you, you meet someone and the very first thing they tell you is the most painful thing that's ever happened to you. In the film, you actually, by the time you hear the pain from them, I mean, you, you understand that there's a lot of pain that has come before them fleeing, but when you hear the, the, the true pain for them, you know them already. You care about Khaldun. You care about Medija. You actually feel connected to these individuals, and I think that that makes it very personal. There's also a sense of that pain, whether it's been said or not, there's a sense of that pain from the first frame of the film. You go through all of their store, all of the moments of their life with that sort of sense of knowing that they come from great pain. Well, we actually found incredible drone footage of um, the, the, the city that Khaldun and Yasmin, who are two of the main subjects of the film, have just told you they're from. Um, we found this incredible drone footage of just decimated homes. It's called homes, and it's just gone. And I think it was very important for the beginning of the film for you to know what they've lost and know what they can't go back to. Was there was the idea for you as well to sort of get past the desensitize the dehumanizing nature of the way that we talk about the refugee crisis and to have something that was humanizing? Well, I knew the process. I knew that these families that eventually we will pick to to move with them and and tell you all their journey, that there will have to be people who had lived in Jordan. They always do. They come first to Jordan or Lebanon. But the Lebanese don't come to America. They go some, somewhere else. So I knew they would have lived in Jordan a while. And they would have had uh, some kind of uh, a time where they can just thank the Lord for safety, uh, send their children to school. So I knew this will be our, perhaps, choice. And Alexandra immediately agreed and chose very well these four families. So when they, don't forget, it's their choice to go to America. They ask to leave. And uh, be, so they must know the risk. Uh, they are given, um, if you like, they are given uh, guidance from the American embassy and the, from Jordanian authorities and NGOs what to expect. But the overwhelming thing is the American dream. They all come thinking that the American dream is just waiting for them to arrive. They've gone through a lot of hardship. No one leaves one's home by with their own choice. No one runs away with nothing on their back, not even a passport, if they, I mean, by choice. So these people have suffered a lot, but they had a period of settling in Jordan for three years. That's why by the time they come to America, by the time we picked them up here in America and they went and settled with the IRC, this is the International Rescue Committee for Refugees, they have to come through a board like that. They cannot just walk in. They have to come through one of the NGOs. And so they were already learning to be away from home. And it's, they're nostalgic, but they have chosen to be away, far away from home, you know, chasing the American dream. And that's why Alexandra was adamant, and I'm really in total agreement on that, that the film have to express hope. In spite of the suffering, in spite of their anxiety, hope is at the end of that tunnel. The biggest, of course, the biggest handicap is the language. It's terrible when you arrive somewhere and you cannot say, I want a glass of water. That perhaps what was the biggest obstacle. I think one of the ways that you're able to focus on hope as well is to not focus too much on our current president. There is a brief section of the film, but by kind of limiting the amount that we see people talk about him and hear people talk about him. And I don't think it's false to have that. Most people go about their daily lives without talking about him. I, I hope some of us can do that. I don't know if I do that, but I hope some of us do. Uh, you get a sense of hope. You get a sense of 
pro progression for, for these families. Was that intentional? Was there a lot of footage that you removed that them talking about what was going on? Because there's really just a brief section in the film. I don't think they were focused, they're not focused on the political here in the same way that we are. Um, I think that they're just like living moment to moment. Um, I think that when, when the ban happened, um, it was definitely very stressful for them because they felt like, wait, are we not actually welcome here? We're hearing all these things on the news. Should we not be here? You know, and I, I do think that you know, even though it is a choice to come here, it's it really wasn't a choice to leave their home. Yeah. It's a choice to leave Jordan, but they didn't. They they want to be home. They didn't want to be here. Um, they you know they they hope that in you know that this is a place that they might be able to have a future. But it was very that was that was very stressful. Um, in some ways, sometimes people didn't even um, they didn't even talk about it in the way that we would expect them to. They would say, "Well, I'm just focusing on getting a job." You know, or do you think that um, do you think that they don't really want me here, or um, you know, I'm never going to see my brother again? I mean, that was another issue. It seemed to emotionally greatly affect the emotions of those that had decided to spend their lives working to better the lives of the refugees, those that were working, those the working NGOs, and people like that, who really felt like the their work their life's work was kind of being cut out from under them in a way. I think it was, it was very stressful for them and it was also for the, 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 one of the wonderful things about the Baltimore refugee resettlement, the, the IRC in Baltimore, is that they have a lot of refugees who are now caseworkers. And I think for people with a longer view um, who had come 10 years ago, I think it was extremely painful. So one woman in the film who's a caseworker who um, you know, is, was a refugee herself, I think it was, it was extremely painful to see that and to know what's ahead. Um, how did you go about choosing these families in, oh. in Jordan? Well, we, th we chose them here. Oh, you chose them yeah, here. We chose Excuse them here. Me. I'm yeah, so yeah, sorry. Yeah. We chose them here. Um, they, um, it was really a combination of who was comfortable being on camera, who wanted to talk to us. I mean, we had one scene where we filmed, I think it was, there were nine Syrian women, and we only have two that were showing their faces. Um, not everyone was comfortable. And sometimes it just meant being around the office for days and days and days and weeks and until people got comfortable with us. Um, some people, like Khaldun, really wanted to tell his story. Um, it was interesting. I had said this um, earlier to Furial, but that the idea that they, you know, in, in Syria, they don't have a lot of long form documentaries. So some of these families said, yes, sure, I'll be interviewed, thinking. You're still here? You're yes, still here? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thinking like, oh, I'm gonna do an interview and then it's right. gonna be done. And every week we'd show up and be like, oh, hi, hi, hi. So it, it, it took a little while for them to get comfortable with calling us. Like sometimes I'd show up and I'd say, um, they'd say, oh, this amazing thing happened yesterday. And I'd say, but why didn't you call me? <laughs> Oh, we're supposed to call you? I said, yes. So, they, but we got on board. Everyone got on board. You used to like state news packages or something where it's like a brief interview and yes, they say yes, something really yes, positive yes. and then cut into something. Right. Yeah. But finally, by the end of the year, one of Madiha called me and said, oh, uh, Muhammad is graduating on June 5th. And I said, great, can we film it? She said, well, that's why I'm calling you. <laughs> We're there. They're going to go on to be documentary filmmakers. Absolutely, now. they know the process. Yes, they know it well. Uh, back and forth. What was the what was the hardest part about making this the, this film? What were the biggest challenges? Um, I I would say that language was the hardest for me. Um, I think I learned very quickly that it had to be a Syrian dialect translator, um, interpreter always with me. Um, I felt that um, you know, having someone who, where, it, where there was even a possibility of a word or two not translating or cultural differences, you know, having an Iraqi translator, or having, that it was important that it be a Syrian dialect translator. Um, trans, we translated 250 hours of footage um, because it was very important to also have the asides and the small moments and, and really that's where the intimacy is. Well, this is also the kind of documentary where you can tell uh, hundreds of hours of footage was shot because the work is really put in to find these small, these very small, meaningful moments. Yes, I mean, it was, and I think the other piece that was hard was, um, it was hard to be so intimately connected, and I still am, with people who are grieving the loss of home. And that was something I wasn't quite prepared for. Um, yeah, oftentimes with documentary subjects, you become... It's very hard to keep them at an arm's length or with any sort of like journalistic distance. Yeah, it's 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 a different dynamic. I mean, I just went to the thirtieth birthday party of someone I filmed in, in two thousand three, when she was sixteen. Yeah, I mean, it's a very it's a very um, different experience. What were your thoughts when you first saw the film? 
Well, I kind of, the film, I saw it in bits and pieces as we went along and visiting the families. So I, I also know the type of uh, films that Alexandra does from her previous films. And I, we agreed that from the beginning it has to be truthful. Say it as it unfolds. We add nothing. Yesterday I spoke and I said no tricks, no gimmicks, no book, no script. From the heart, the truth. We want to relate to the people the truth, how, what these people uh, go through. But to go back to one of your earlier questions about their fears, when there was some talk that uh, no, no more refugees can come in, uh, their initial fear were the, about the family members who were on their way here, that they cannot come. That was traumatic for them. One of them had a brother on the way. And then they felt that perhaps if they leave, they cannot come back, their situation is different. No one can send the refugee away. They knew that much, I suspect. Alexandra doesn't think that they knew that, but someone should have uh, explained that to them. But the fact that they felt not welcome in a way, because what does it mean? It means you don't want my brother to come? It means I'm not welcome either. It created a moment of fear and anxiety, and I talked to one of them at the time, I said, would you go back home? One of them was really had a beautiful answer. He, Haldun, in fact, he said, I will not go home now. I will go back home when I am a proud American. Sweet, huh? Yeah. And the others said, no. We, I mean, mostly two men said they'd like to go back home when they get the American citizenship. Triumphant, successful, not as refugees. And you had said, I think you had said this to me in the in the green room that, um, you know, when the ban came down, it's basically being given them more anxiety after they already have collectively a lot of anxiety within their family as they're trying to acclimate themselves yes. to a completely different culture and missing their home. Yes, of course. I mean, who leaves their home uh, voluntary like that? And uh, in fact, she was showing us one of the ladies, I think you saw in the film, her home in her village and with the broken doors and everything. Uh, these people are exactly the same people like everyone else, have the same dreams, the same hopes. It's children at school, good life, with dignity. They're also suffering from PTSD a lot yeah. of the time as yeah. well, because they are coming from a, yes. a war-torn country. I mean, the only difference between them and the average, any family, is that they're, they're unlucky. They had to leave. And in the big picture of things, today I consider them lucky. The fact that Jordan was very hospitable, they had a good life there, and, uh, and they knew that at the end of that journey, uh, they will come to America. And ordinarily, America would have welcomed more of them, ordinarily. And the ones who were able to come are very lucky. And so, on the whole, they took a bad thing and they made it better. And that's what we try to show in the film. One of the things that I love about the film, and we kind of already touched on this, is that there aren't a lot of talking heads explaining the sort of uh, the regular way it goes for, for refugees in this country. You really, and I said this before, did the work and found moments that told the story themselves while also being quite intimate. That's, did you know that that's how you wanted to do it going into it? Yes. Or? I mean, it's how I like, it's, it's definitely how I like to work. I feel... Um, the hard way. It is the hard way, <laughs> but I, I'm allergic. I, 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 there are people who do talking head documentaries extremely well, experts, you know, where they have experts on, and, and it's, a, it's a very um, specific genre of documentary. I, I am more interested in people, in connecting, in sort of human behavior, in bringing you into someone's home, into their kitchen, and into their lives. And I think... Um, do you worry about context with something like this and making sure that all of the scenes have the right context? Or do you feel like you they provide their own depending on how you film them? And I think it depends. I mean, I think that, you know, sometimes sometimes there are scenes that need set up and we work on that. I have an incredible editor, Toby Shimon, who we, you know, we worked on our last film together um, and and we work on context. But I think that um, I think that you know, you can do it with the subjects themselves. It doesn't have to be, um, and we and we actually were very um, lucky that we had Sousen, who is an IRC caseworker, who was also a refugee, because she could serve as a bridge and she could give context. I mean, for the Trump ban, she was the one who gave the context, really. Mm. Right. So I think I think we employed different things. But I, I like it, the more verite and the more, um, fly on the wall, obser observational, um, and not sort of telling you. I don't, I never, 
you know, yes, documentary is a construction, but if you feel like you're watching a construction, then I failed. And that said, though, you weren't totally committed to being a fly on the wall as well. You are right. very much allow a subject to come over and interview them briefly right. about it. So you're not really um, committed to one rule over the other. I right. Think. It's a combination. I, I don't think I could have made this movie purely observational. It's, I think it really only works when it's in, if we had just stayed in the office. So if we were only in the Baltimore IRC office, we could have done it observational. Why not just call Frederick Wiseman to exactly, make it? Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> then Frederick Wiseman, exactly, I don't need to make it, yeah. And I love his work, but yeah. Uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who's a question right here? Hi. Um, so you mentioned that a lot, uh, most of the, a lot of the refugees from Syria go to Jordan first. I was wondering how many actually uh, decide to stay in Jordan as compared to leaving or coming to the United States or uh, other countries, and, and if that's created any tensions with the border of Jordan and Syria. You ask how many uh, ask to leave Jordan? Is that what you, your question? Uh, Sorry, yeah, or how many decide to stay? For, uh, well, um, I think there is not a question of decision here. There is no, somewhere, there is no anywhere else to go. Uh, so we have over a million, um, a lot over a million refu Syrian refugees, and they're still coming in. The minute there is news that there might be a war or, or something, they come. Even they don't wait for the bombing anymore. They just come before. Uh, so they don't actually decide one way or another. They have no home, remember? So some of them apply. Mostly they apply for the United States. Uh, in the old days, the United States was absorbing much more than now. Now they're shrinking the number that's allowed to come here. So they, it's, it's kind of a lottery. They all apply, or some of them apply. Some of them are happy in Jordan. They get jobs. They speak the language. There's not much difference between the Jordanian and the Syrian. I mean, dialect maybe a little bit the food, but they're the same people. So they're happy. They settle in Jordan. And uh, some of them want to pursue the dream, the American dream. They apply. Out of um, 2,000 applications, the, finally, maybe four or five get to come here. So it's, it's a hard vetting system. They don't just say, OK, you win, you come. And it's 18 months to two years. Yeah. So, so. it's difficult to come here. So they're lucky when they get here. Uh, I think we have time for one more. Hi. We're going to take the next question from an online viewer. Melissa would like to know, what do you want refugees specifically to take away from this film? Um, what would we want refugees to take away from this film? That there are a lot of people in this country that welcome you. Um, that there are many, many, many people who, um, who remember that parts of their family come from all over the world. That the immigration story is actually the American story. Um, and that, um, you know, it'll get better. We hope. Americans should remember, I mean, there's a, I don't want to give anything away from the movie, but there's a wonderful uh, woman in the film who really kind of adopts uh, one of one of the families and does everything they can to help her. And it's a, a really beautiful story, and it, it, it really shows we should remember that these are people that need help, you know? They, they came here because they need help. They're not whatever the divisive rhetoric that is being thrown around, they're just people that need help, yeah. And, and they can contribute, too. Yes. They can contribute. They, they need help, but they will get on their feet and they will contribute. Absolutely. And do you know something I just learned this morning? That uh, the first eight months, they take subsidy from IRC, and then they're on their own. The government gives them only $500 a family of um, food um, uh, assistance, which means that they are a family of six, the ones we know here. And after eight months, they have to go and find work. That's fine. All of this is fine. But they pay tax on all of this. On, on the subsidies they get, they pay tax. On the ha help from the government, $500 worth of food, they pay tax. So from the beginning, they kind of learned the American way. And um, I didn't know until this morning that this is the fact. Well, their wages are being taxed. Their wages are being taxed, but you, it's sort of like, wait, OK, so my wages are being taxed, and then you're giving me assistance. Yes. <laughs> but so. Yeah. Um, congratulations on the film. Thank you uh, so June much. June 22nd, 8 PM, Epics. Everybody, please give them a round of applause for the wonderful film that they made. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks. Thanks.